I think it's uh, time to start. Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming to this course. Um, I'm Agnes, I'm the coordinator of the Green Office and together with the people in the back we organized this course for you. So hopefully you will enjoy it. Uh, today we will have uh, a lecture from Henk Manschot. Uh, he will talk a little bit about uh, philosophy and sustainability. Uh, we have a lecture for about 30 to 45 minutes and also part of the lecture will be that we will uh, discuss among yourselves. Uh, we also have uh, a list, please sign your name on there so we know that you've been to the lecture. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, you can take it. Thank you. Good morning everyone. And happy, happy, very happy that you came on a lovely Monday morning for a course that is not yeah, legally not part of your curriculum, I suppose. It's free, it's optional. And to do that philosophy on a Monday morning to start with is not so easy. So I think it is good to start with a small movie. We had some problems with the technical part, but I hope it will work. I will explain you later why I start with this movie. Perhaps it is good to switch the lights off? Yes. <laughs> it's the experience of the astronauts about the Earth. Can you make it larger? Um, you can make it full screen? first time. 
you're overwhelmed by how much more beautiful it really is when you see it for real. It's just like it's this dynamic, alive place that you see growing all the time. It was truly incredible to be up there um, doing what I've always wanted to do my whole life and then to kind of glance back at our planet and uh, see that view was just tremendous. tell why I start with this movie and why I consider it as important to go back to that experience because it is uh, the first time in the history of humanity that 
humans saw the earth from outside. Until that time, we had only a look from the earth to the sky, to the moon, to the stars. And all cosmology was about moon, stars, and the relation of humans to that. Here, for the first time, they changed the perspective. We can see now from outside the earth, and we can see it as a whole. And it gives completely new experiences and sentiments, as you said. Or wonder, but also vulnerability. This is the first time that, in philosophy at least, I am a philosopher. The notion of vulnerability, the quality of vulnerability, was related to the Earth. Never before we have thought of the Earth as vulnerable. So I think that's a strong new experience, an experience that we, in our time, experience in a different way by climate crisis and other crises. But vulnerability is a new issue related to the Earth. Never before in history the Earth had been seen as, as vulnerable. I think it's important to realize we are entering a new phase in our relation to the Earth. The third experience that is new, and it came also from the astronauts, if you, you look at the overview effect, you will see it later on in the movie, at least they discovered that they can only go back to the Earth. And they call it Homeland Earth, because in the endless galaxy, the only planet where they could go back to live was the Earth. And that also gave a strong impression about relation from humans to the Earth, but also about vulnerability. And is it not strange that the only planet we know in the cosmos with life is the Earth. No other one so far. We know there's some water, we know there's some oxygen. Some people think that with a lot of technical instruments they can shoot five, six people to another planet. But normally we can only live on Earth. Is that not straight? I at least find that something that I can't explain. I don't ask for a creation, don't ask for an explanation of God, but neither I would deny that it is something that we can't explain so far. We don't know why only on one plan of the cosmos there is life. It is a complete hazard if you will, explain it in terms of science, and that means nothing. <coughs> so I think it is important, if you start to reflect on sustainability, that you reflect on the Earth, that you reflect on the planet with life, and that you realize that recently we discovered it is the only planet so far where we can live. So that's one strange discovery, at least for me. The second, we know also, is that in the last 100 years, 150 years, humanity has changed as well. Humanity has, has grown from 1 billion to 7.5 billion in 100 years. Never before we were so big as we are now. And we go up to now. In the last hundred years. And if you combine these two things, I think we start to realize, or we start at least to question, if we are not entering a new phase in the evolution, we are not, not starting a new, new period in the interaction between humans and the Earth, and if all the questions we experience now as difficult, as disruptive, as destructive, are not part of that, that problem. Uh, if you look at this evolutionary scheme, it's perhaps difficult to read, you see the different phases of the evolution. Millions of years. 
billions of years. And you see at the end, on top, <coughs> on top of the Holocene, after billions of years, the name of the Anthropocene, it's called the Anthropocene, is a new period in the evolution. And Anthropos means human, so it is the period on Earth where humans are the main, even geological force on Earth. So even geologists who study only oceans and other kind of natural phenomena say now from a, even a geological perspective humanity is the greatest force on Earth. The hand of humans are everywhere, we are able to change everything. And the question is, what then is a good interaction between humans and the Earth? I think that is the main question of the Anthropocene. What's the good interaction? And I think, yeah, a cause like this, I'm very happy that you are here, but also our universities should, should start with that question because it, it touches everything the food, the energy, the nature, biodiversity question, the climate. You cannot imagine one question that is not implicated in this issue. And still, universities start to teach a lot of things, and it's only outside the curriculum that there is some space for reflection on sustainability. That is, for me, a very strange contradiction. I'm happy that the Green Office will change it, will transform the university in, uh, I think, five years. You can have some crisis and it will, it will be big. <coughs> okay, what I would like to do now, here's an outline of my presentation. I will, have, in fact, zoom out and reflect with you first on the human earth interaction in the Anthropocene. I will start with that. We'll have a small discussion after that with you, and then I go to the second part, rethinking the human earth relationships from three perspectives, the planetary perspective that I saw, where you, you take the planet as a whole, you look as if you can see the whole planet and how you can reflect on the human uh, earth interaction from that perspective. I will think also to the local perspective, you living in Groningen, living on a certain place on Earth, every one of us lives on a certain place on Earth. That's your first contact with the Earth. The first contact with the Earth is here, where we are now sitting in this room. And the third perspective is a personal perspective. How do we reintegrate ourselves in the fabric of life? Is that possible? And if so, how do we do it? So that's the outline of my talk of this morning. Some questions, some disappointments, <laughs> some people thinking that's not where I came from. <clears throat> it's a, f a philosophical place, I would say. But I think it gave a kind of a frame in which you can study concrete issues that will be part of the next lessons, I think, of this course. Okay, no questions so far? Let's go on. I start with the Earth. What's your idea of the Earth? <coughs> if it is so important. Yeah? I think it's one living organism. It's one living? Organism. Ah. Okay, can you explain that? Like, like I am one organism which is living in the center of my, I don't know, sentient being. I have my heart, for example, which yeah. is my motor and I think Earth as well is just one living organism in the heart of the essence there is a sand and thus it enables life on its surface and can destroy it also but it's just one okay okay it's a wonderful image it's a living organism yes it's a yeah quite new inside because for Copernicus it was just an object, a planet, between other planets. 
<coughs> some other impressions. You live on Earth, and you have an idea about the Earth, I suppose. Um, well, I do agree with Copernicus a bit more, okay. in, in the sense that it is an object, okay. but uh, it's quite a large object, right? Yes. So, uh, we are very tiny compared to the Earth. So, it's, for me, it's more a sense of scale. Um, okay. And obviously, it's very hard to live outside of the Earth. Uh, so, it's kind of like hugely important. Yes. And you would have to travel like uh, light years to see other places where you might live. Mm. So, yeah, that's kind of like some sub how kind of important it is to me. Um, that's the way I, I would describe it. Okay. okay. Is there someone who would like to? Describe nature or the planet as a partner. What? As a partner. A partner. And do you know cultures who do that? Yeah, I do think that uh, every living thing on the, on the, on Earth is a partner. We're a part of some some, uh, some kind of ecosystem where we okay. help each other or Animals not help each other. Yes. Well, I think we do sometimes. Hi. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't think that the planet itself is uh, is a partner of us. I think it's just uh, make of, uh, yeah, making us able to uh, to help each other. Okay. So the idea of the planet as the caring mother, let's say indigenous cultures, the planet is the caring mother. We have to respect. We have to. to I wouldn't talk Which about the planet as some kind of mother. Do it, huh? but, no. 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 But I do say that if you will talk in a relationship, you can better say that the planet is a bitch. And then we, as modern adults, have to treat with that bitch. And the bitch is saying, if you do, you do this to me, I do that to you. Climate cries, destruction, and so on. So if you don't respect me, I don't respect you. I found that an interesting comparison. We cannot go back to the caring mother idea, but is there some possibility to think the Earth is, in terms of a partner, different from human beings, of course, different from God, because we don't have any belief in God, so, so many modern people say we don't need that, but still a partner, let's see. So I, I think the problem with partnership is, by implication, you place nature as a personified entity on the same importance as, you, as humanity, which yeah. if we're going to change the way we think, it should probably revert back to the mother existence in which we are almost subservient to okay. some bigger thing. So you would say the, the caring mother is not such, such a bad idea? No. As, as a metaphor, probably. Yes. Yeah? Okay. okay, let's see what uh, I have discovered there's four features that I consider as important. You have mentioned them already. The interconnectedness of all living beings on Earth. That's one thing we are now discovering. You cannot destroy one element without destroying the effect on the other system. And so on. The biosphere is one great interactive life field. It's an important discussion, I think. But I think that is one of the discoveries we are now going into, and that's the reason why we are much more aware of ecosystems and the eco one small ecosystem and the combination of ecosystems and so on. The second reflection is that the Earth itself is a living being. It's not a place on which you find life, but it is itself a living organism, as you have said, a living being, and one of the scientists who came up with that idea in 1976, James Lovelock, he said, I explained that because the Earth is able to regulate temperature. And regulating temperature is a quality of life. He, he compared the Earth with a camel, and he said, look at a camel in the desert. Camel can regulate his body from minus 40 to plus 25 and even higher. So it's a huge range of, of temperature regulation. We humans can just go from 35 to 42. 
think you are dead. The Earth, what's the range of temperature? The Earth can go up and down. If you follow discussions, you see that the whole climate change discussion is about low temperature. If the Earth will warm up 2 degrees, 70% of life will die on Earth. 70%. Until now, the Earth regulated it very well. No problem. Never have been a problem. Now we start questioning. Temperature is going up. We are looking for reasons why. We see that the green gas houses are an important effect. Green gas houses are an effect of human activity and so on. And scientists say, <coughs> perhaps it is too late. So the whole idea of crisis and crisis in the future became part of our notion of the Earth. If we think about the Earth, sometimes it is, would we survive? Would we survive? And the survival question is related to climate, and climate to temperature, and temperature to life. So, so you see, the idea that to see the Earth as a living is not so bad, but we haven't any concept or category to think a living being beyond animals and humans and trees and so on. There is not in our system of reflection a new category, a huge living being calling the Earth. We don't know what that means. But there are some effects that indicate it should perhaps be a good idea to study that as well as an option. Third dimension of the Earth that I consider as important. And there I go back to the astronauts. Many people, many people have sentiments and emotions when they look at nature and the Earth. The astronauts from outside all wonder, vulnerability, gratitude, all emotions, not intellectual knowledge, not explanations, but emotions. So an emotional relation between humans and the Earth is a very important dimension of our thinking about the Earth. In many cultures, the indigenous cultures I talked of had that emotional relation. Caring mother was an emotional expression. It's of course not a scientific description, but it's an emotional expression. An emotional expression that helps the community to find a way of practice and of behavior. It's interesting that they had many rituals and they were very familiar with the earth as a caring mother and they know that they had to respect the biodiversity and they know and so on and so on. They lived for centuries without disturbing whatsoever. Small disturption, but the earth could very well handle that. We don't have really an emotional image of the Earth. That's very strange. And the reason, I think, has to do with modernity, with Copernicus, what I start with, and modern philosophy, we said the Earth is an object, is a resource center, and we as humans can take from the Earth what we want, and we can waste what we want, and the Earth will absorb what the Earth is not interesting has nothing to say. And there came a distinction between humans and the non-humans, and the value was about humans, and instrumentality, what can be used for humans for the happy life, became the earth, animals included. So, in our modern concept of the earth, an idea of we have to respect the earth, the earth is a living being. Many people have emotions to the earth, we are part of the earth. We don't have yet the cosmology, as it is called, a way of looking to the earth that is at the one end <coughs> adapted to our scientific knowledge we have, and on the other hand, respecting or even creating or even stimulating an emotional picture 
emotional world view, earth view. That is not in there. I think one of the things we have to do, we have to invite, and their philosophy and cultural science and art are very important input disciplines. We have to reimagine, to recreate an emotional image of the earth with which we can interact and relate and feel that it is something valuable for us, but we don't have that at this time, in my opinion. I come with my last point, a philosophical point, that I already mentioned as well. There are no <coughs> philosophers, Latour, Stengers, Stengers, Isabel Stengers is a great scientific philosopher, Belgian woman, <coughs> who starts to think that we should invent an idea of partnership or actorship that is greater than only human beings. Actorship now is, is limited to human beings. We, call, we, we consider only humans as actors. Animals starts now to be an actor, animal rights and animal questions. So if animals are actors, difficult, trees are not actors. And she said, no. It could be that's also a heritage of modernity, that whole idea of autonomy and actorship and freedom and so on and so on, that we must invent a new, larger idea of actorship and say the earth could be an actor as well. We don't know exactly what we then say, are saying, we don't know yet. We have to, to find out what the kind of an actor we have never thought of before could be. And is it possible then to think about new ways of interaction? It's not a pitch, I would say. It was very clear. I found that a very nice expression because it makes immediately clear that you have two adults, in fact, fighting. And many people are now, in fact, presenting the human earth relationship as a fight. We are fighting with the earth. We are trying how far we can go, and the earth is responding and saying, if you will, this that. I find that interaction also interesting to rethink from a philosophical perspective. But I say immediately, we don't know yet how to do that. We cannot go back to the caring mother ideas of the indigenous cultures, because that is too, in our opinion, too. You know, what? Too primitive or too simple or something, even if it is a very nice idea. But if you would like to give the Earth the name actor, what then would you integrate in that notion of actorship? So that, about the art, you see there are at least four different dimensions that can invite us to rethink the Earth in the human earth relationship and to also develop these dimensions. And I don't know from which science you are, which disciplines, but if you are from art and cultural science and literature, I think there is an architecture. There is a lot of things to do here, to be very creative, to read what other cultures have done, to think about this interaction and to find out new ways of representation, imaginaries, and creating a new social imaginary is what this, this is called. I call it, we need a new Terra Sophi. Terra means Earth in Latin, Sophia means wisdom. So we need a new kind of, not only science of the Earth, but wisdom of the Earth. Wisdom that can go into practice, into imaginaries, into dreams, into needs, into internal. We are the starting point of a new Terra Sophy. And it is different from the cosmology, the classical cosmology, because the classical <coughs> cosmology was about the stars and the moon and the relation from, from humans to the outside. Terra Sophy is the other way around, it's the relation from humans to the earth and to life on earth and what that means. So that so far, yes. Let me look at my time because 
The second, I, I said it already, important change over the last hundred years is humanity. You see here how the species humanity was growing over the last hundred years. <coughs> it's kind of a yardstick. Over hundred year, hundreds of years within the limit of one, one million, one billion, the Earth has no problem to integrate all the humans did in their life cycle. And over the last hundred years, from one billion to seven and a half billion, going up to nine billion, even if the growth rate goes down. But at the end, the Earth has to support nine billion human beings in the life cycle. Also a new phenomenon, you see? That's for me the reason to say we are really entering a new phase in evolution. I have one question. Yes. Why do they assume that it's going back the growth of human people? Because what, what, what we hope, what we expect, is that by education, by information, by seeing uh, also the problem we will come up with, that the number of people born in different countries will go down. But even if you start with seven and a half million a year now, you would say a birth rate of two children per couple. You go, the rate goes down, but the number still is very high. That's why what is mentioned here. So we have to calculate the life on Earth with 9 billion people. How do we do that? 9 billion people. Okay? Um, I formulated three basic principles for my theosophic idea. The first is the Earth as a living being can no longer support development towards the ways of life invented by modernity it's all developed since modernity invented a new way of life, technology, industry, and so on and so on. Humans have to adapt themselves and their needs, desires, dreams, imaginations to the planetary boundaries. I found that a very nice word is from Rockström and John Rockström is director of the Resilience Center in Stockholm, who made an estimation of the Earth's but the planetary boundaries where we should not, not go all over. And he said we have to respect certain things in the, our deforestation or in our fishing of the sea or in our and so on and so on. So they made a list of planetary boundaries. I found that word very helpful. And they say we have to create an idea of development that will stay within these boundaries and not going over them. The green course is called growth, green growth course. Is that not, um, can you explain the notion growth in this? Uh, uh, <laughs> in a nutshell. Um, yeah, the idea about it was that um, basically, we plant a seed um, about uh, thinking about sustainability, about your place on the earth, and how you want to develop yourself, and how you want to see the society, basically, and then that seed grows. And oh, that I see. That I see. You, you, you act upon what you plant. That's kind of the okay. idea behind it. Okay, it's not the earth or, or human's activity itself economically growing. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no, it's about the That's the normal means. I, when I saw a green growth course, I saw, oh, what exactly what they are going to do. Oh, <laughs> well. <laughs> it's a little bit ambivalent, I yeah. would say. But it's interesting, therefore, uh, thank you for your explanation. Okay. I think this is a very important statement. Humans have to adapt. We are not familiar with We are familiar with the idea we are free, we are autonomous, we are masters of our own life, we can choose the way we would like to live. Let's do it in many different ways. Pluralism, open, no limits. I think that's the main dominant 
commercial imagination. We can imagine what we want. And that's human. And here it is said, oh, stop. Many things of your needs and dreams and desire have to be transformed in one way or another. And I will show in the second part how, what that means in a different part of the world. But I think that's a very strong, basic statement. And we are just starting with it. Some people who are ecologically aware start with it. But we are far from where we have, have to be. I think. That's my second thing. I was just going to say, too, do you think that we need to have a sustained period of degrowth? Do I think that we have a sustainability of degrowth? Is the answer already included in your question? <laughs> what would you think? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, people, lots of there have been lots of people who've spoken about the need for degrowth and decentralisation yeah. and stuff. So okay. You, will, do you, you think we are? It's possible. Yeah. Or is it technical transformation? Could be a solution. As well. I come back to that. Third principle: belonging to the earth, being an earthling expression from a French thinker called Bruno Latour. Member of the Earth community becomes our first, first identity marker. And then I mean that now we think our identity is national. We have Dutch or American. We have civil rights on us and so on. Or is gender and our women are in between or trans uh, identity questions. What if our first identity, we would take it as we are Muslims? We are living on earth and that's our first identity. And it gives certain responsibilities. And these responsibilities can come in conflict with national identity, American way of life, for instance. Of Dutch way of life. Luxembourgian way of life is a very unsustainable way of life. So if you take your Ursuline identity very serious, probably you will come in, in conflict with some of your national identity rights. And the whole government formation that is going on now, one of the questions is sustainability, but it's not going very far. So it could be that there, in the future becomes much more fighting elements in the Earthling identity on the one hand and the civil identity on the other hand. Okay, this is my first part. Is it good to make a five minutes break and then go to the second part? Is it is it okay so far? Yeah. Good. Thank you. And if you have any questions, if you think it is nonsense, oh, I okay. I a break for five minutes and then we'll start. Okay, let's start for the second part of the presentation. And, um, as I saw, three three perspectives, I don't know really if I can do the all the three, but we will see. I will start with the planetary perspective. Do you know something from the ecological footprint? Is that a familiar idea for you? Not too familiar, I see. What I mean? Yeah, also. Can you explain a little bit? It's not easy. But I will explain it later, but I would yeah. like to... I'd say you do the amount of like, square kilometers that you need to sustain yourself. Yeah, exactly. Yes. But the, 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 the footprint is calculating is how many hectares are needed for the Earth to sustain your lifestyle. That's a very easy measure. They have calculated, I don't give you how they came to that, but that's their way. So they calculated the whole earth, how many hectares are on the earth, and they calculate 
the number of hectares, each lifestyle, American lifestyle, Dutch lifestyle, and uh, in fact needed. And then you come to a certain idea. I will, will show. There were two measures about human development. One was the human development index. And the human development index measured areas of health, schooling, and age. So, say, I looked at the population, for instance, Holland or Uganda, and you ask what is the health situation, the illness, what kind of health service is there, how many people go to school, boys and girls, and how long, and what's the life, um, the lifetime, the, the time you can live on Earth, and if some countries maximum is, is, is 45 or 60, and we are now going up to 80, and so on. So that were the three measures for the Human Development Index, and they compared different countries, and you could see that from, for instance, Holland is very high in the Human Development Index. Uganda was pretty low. Another country was also pretty low. So it helped countries to compare their situation between each other. There was no information about implication for sustainability if what we have developed as a health system or what we have developed as a, our long age is there some destructive effects in it. It was not considered in the Human Development Index. And therefore came the Sustainable Human Development Index it was not only about health, age, education and so on, but it was on impact of a lifestyle on us. I found it a very interesting step. You see, it's only invented in 2004, so people started to invent how can we measure the impact of human development on us. I show you four icons. This is the first one. Look at the bottom. At the bottom you see the Human Development Index line and the different colors indicate different countries. I have written them down. Orange on the top, here, is the footprint line, is, is America. Dark blue is Europe, AU. Light blue is Europe East. Red is Latin America. Light green is the Middle East, and yellow is Africa. And what you see here is you see the Human Development Index line on the bottom and the footprint line on your right hand side. And this part here is the part where all countries have to go in. This is one, one planet. So, if the whole world would like to live like an American lifestyle, we need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight planets to sustain that way of life. We are there somewhere, dark blue. Because if the whole world would like to live as the Dutch way of life, we need one, two, three, four, four and a half. And so on. That's the way they calculate. So you can see immediately that the lifestyle developed in certain countries, Qatar at the moment is traumatic. Because if the whole world will go to live like the Qatari, it will destroy it. So I found that very interesting to, to compare the human development line, here, here you go up. But there is a structural relation between our concept of development on the one hand and a greater foot impact, footprint impact on the other. So in our idea of development, structurally, it's unsustainable. You can see it here. Interesting, interesting for me are the yellow ones. You see, Africa is still within the limit of the footprint. And seen from a sustainable 
development perspective, they are in, in a better position, I would say, than we are. Because they can introduce green technology and they can avoid all the, the polluting technologies we have. I gave this course also in the International Summer School and in general African people think we are underdeveloped or not so developed and we have to imitate development ideas of the United States and so on and so on. But if you look at this point, I say it's, it is just the other way around. You are still in a very good position if you go this way and not that way. And we all, including we in Europe, have to transform our way of life until we come here. Here is another, another graphic that I found interesting. It is the Human Development Index in colors. Very developed. Here and here and here. A little bit less developed here in China, in the also undeveloped Africa. And look at the next one. Ecological footprint per capita. And you see, very bad United States. Very good Africa. It is just the other way around. And that explains to me that our notion of development implicitly has structural integrated ways of, of behavior, of doing, that are not sustainable, that we have called development, that we have called growth, that we have called welfare, and that is not. So how can we come down from this footprint we have? That is the question from sustainability, and therefore we try to change our way of life become more bio, become more eco, uh, other energy issues, the whole thing, all related to lifestyle, we try to transform it. I found it very helpful. And it is also, it gives a real boost to the, the self-conscious and proudness of the people we very long time have called underdeveloped or in development, developing countries. We were the developed countries. I think all these conceptual categories are no longer, no longer helpful. The ecological footprint is worked out by uh, the Living Planet Report. I have to say, Living Planet Report every year. The Living Planet Report is published. If you would like to know how the situation of the world is and how the different countries are, are doing compared to each other, you can for free download the Living Planet Report and it is from this organization, the Global Footprint Network. The Global Footprint Network has a very beautiful website. It's here, globalfootprintnetwork.org. You find all the information, about all the explanations about what exactly a footprint is, how you measure it. And what you find even there, and I would like to have have done it with you this morning is you can even calculate your own footprint. And it's always a little bit shocking, in particular when you fly by planes, if you make probably because that is very, very polluting. But they have also suggestions how you can ameliorate, adapt and so on. I think it's a real helpful site if you would like to know more about the ecological footprint in relation to the human development index and the, the icons I gave you there from there. Last point from the, the planetary perspective, that is the United Nations became of course aware of all these kinds of problems and now they have formulated sustainable development goals. And they would ask all the countries to follow these goals, 17 goals, sustainable development goals. Between 2015 and 2030 will that be the main issue of the United Nations. And here you see the development goals. 
17. No poverty, no hunger, good health, <coughs> quality education, gender, gender equality, clean water, and so on. Take a look. All countries have agreed to these 17 sustainable goals, but they have not agreed how they would achieve them. So there are different, <coughs> different ways of sub-goals integrated, but the idea is that you cannot diminish poverty if you destroy land or nature. That was the big problem, is the big problem of China. China over the last 30 years have diminished poverty. 340 million people out of poverty. That is the number of Europe. It's a huge number. All in six. But the destruction of nature in China is absolutely dramatical. You don't know if some people there in Beijing, I don't know if you are from China, I, I, I see sitting you there. Oh, yeah, from China. Yeah, you are from China. <laughs> yeah. Could you explain a little bit what the climate situation, for instance, from, from Beijing? Oh, yeah, there is a terminology for the pollution, it's called PM, PM 2.5. It's exposed uh, every year. Every year? Yeah, and uh, my parents, they had to buy a small apartment on the mountain. So sometimes on weekends, we went there. Yeah, for, to have some, some yeah, fresh, fresh air. air. <laughs> yeah, so the big cities, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the recently, the government, they tried to make a plan to replace the, the traditional cars into the electronic cars like by 2020 or 30. Okay. But uh, I don't know if it's achievable. Yeah, yeah. No, but I, I found that interesting. I was in China myself. I, my, my ecological switch, I, I got it in China. Oh. Because I was so confronted by two things. One is a very strong a way of, of helping people out of the poverty and second was I have never seen a destruction of the country as in China. Really immense and we discussed it with the government and with other people from the government and they say until so far we are not able to combine both goals. <coughs> but from 21 we will do that. China will make plans, and all the plans will give sustainability a real central place, and we will go down. But we couldn't combine both. I found that interesting. I think China will be a leading country in this, in this field, so I think we're happy to be there. Not yet, but in the future. I don't know if you agree with my optimistic view. <laughs> Yeah. Not really. <laughs> Not really. They, they, they don't really have uh, such a mechanism to sustain their like uh, the, the how to call this uh, political stability, like internal mechanism. Hmm. You know, like every like uh, uh, ten years they have to change the the, the, the political leaders, but yeah, it's just uh, they it's just block door, okay. block door, you know, beating okay. the okay. mechanism. And also our we have a very extremely low birth rate. Yeah. Yeah, that could be a trouble for yeah, driving the problem for the yeah economic development. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't see any solution. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, let's discuss later. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but the important thing here is seventeen goals, but not separately. You cannot as a country say yeah, I take one or I take five out of it and the rest I don't do. You have to take all them together and, and measure every time what impacts is on the other. It is used one moment. It is used already by countries. It is also used by municipalities. It is even used by universities. <coughs> I was last week in the municipality of Utrecht, and Utrecht Green Office will take this and see what the local uh, way of using this these goals could be for the public sector. Nijmegen will be the sustainable city 2018. 
a problem could be the Sustainable University 2019. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, if they are all on equal footing. These goals are are they just goals in themselves? No. What what the United Nations would would explain is the interactivity. That's the most important part. So, if you are concerned about the poverty issue, look when you, you take your measures, what the implications are for that. Okay. That's what it means. And equal, yeah, in certain ways equal. But it is much more, much more complicated to think with all these goals. This one, for instance, I will We'll come to this one now, sustainable cities and communities becomes a very important one because 70% of the population will go to live in cities and in the mega cities and we don't yet have a clue what the sustainable mega city is about. We don't know yet. So there are also much to do for you. That's my, the global perspective. Some questions? No? I go on then. Mm -hmm. Just one quickly. Um, so like the UN kind of represents like a Western yeah. power. And so it is, if we we're, were talking about China before, which is arguably slightly more developed than Africa, yeah. are we going to impose all of these sustainable goals on on a region that's not as developed, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. purely because the West was able to go through this period of enlightenment and destroy the planet, and now we're at a period where we can't do anything such that we force all of these, we remove choice on a mass portion of the population purely because we stuffed up and we still have the control of like bodies like the UN. Um. Is your question that you think uh, uh, that you want to represent the Western? Yeah, is, it, yeah, is that it? Western morally. Morally. Correct. Okay. Is that morally <coughs> correct? That's your question. Yeah. I'm not an expert. Is there somebody who can answer this question? But I see that. Yeah. I, I totally understand your point, but I think um, we, we, we kind of have to. Um, maybe take charge is, is a bad word, but, but guide them because yes. um, they are less developed so we we have the techniques to go green and maybe implement that in, in Africa for example uh, because if they will live like us for a hundred of years like we did which is their right of course uh, then there will be no planet left so I think Hard, but nothing. Kind of have to pressure them. <coughs> okay. Uh, yeah, if I may uh, say something in, indeed about this is that if you give them the choice to follow the same path as we did, uh, we did, we'd rather uh, show them our faults because it's easy to use the laws of thermodynamics and stuff because it's well well known to uh, also uh, use combustion engines for them. So instead of taking the easy route and polluting the planet, you'd uh, rather say, well, take the hard route with us, or <coughs> actually lead us, uh, uh, if possible, uh, because we did something wrong, and we already know it's wrong, so please don't do it. I mean, we'd be rather okay. sad, right? Okay. Thank you. And I think, from our perspective, it's about us being humble with these, we call them developing countries, because we, as Europeans or US Americans and so on, we enslaved them, we destroyed them, and we committed genocides, and so we have to ask them for forgiveness, and not go there and say, okay, this is our way, we have to do like this. And I think there it is. More imperative where we should ask for forgiveness. Thank you. Yeah. 
I think we ran out of time to be morally correct, actually. Mm -hmm. I think um, in the next, I don't know, 50 years, they're going to be refugees. They're going to come here because we're wealthy. We have water. We have food here. They're not going to have that. They're going to burn in the sun. And I don't know. We don't care because we're wealthy. We're going to survive. It's our instinct to survive for ourselves, for our family, for our friends. It's not our instinct to help strangers survive. So I think that time's kind of passed already. Where we can like say, well, do we want them? Like, I don't know. To help them or... <coughs> you see how many problems are involved if you touch this kind of issues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, has that I to do with just, your... It's, it's not only a war, so... There's not not a thing about like well, can we like help them also? There's there's not enough resources to like help all of the people and be morally correct about well we can help you develop yourself in that correct way or whatever. It's I think that it's too what why is that not possible? Well, because humanity has screwed up over not just the last hundred years. I think it goes like okay. back. So okay. I'm just Okay, thank you for that, that opinion. Um, when I give these kind of talks, uh, it, at the beginning sometimes I ask, ask people, are you, are you pessimistic about the future? And half of the audience say uh, yes. So, going a little bit in your direction and so on. And then the second question is, and what then? And my answer is, we can try. I think. And if we will succeed, we don't know. But if we don't try, we will not succeed. So I'm in favor, and I'm on the side of people. I, I agree with you, we have to really address the question of pessimism critical information about the future. We are living in, with a kind of, of fear. The idea of survival is very strong. And then with all the question of resources and migration and everything coming up. So the future is full of, of crisis-like phenomena. And I think it has an impact on us that in fact paralyzes us. People say, what does it make? And I would like to feed the other kind and say, I don't know if that is true. Don't make yourself the owner of the future. We don't know what the future is about. We don't know exactly. We extrapolate what we are doing now and say, if we are going that way to the future, then etc. But perhaps we are changing. And we changed a lot over the last 10 years. So let's take the other side. That's what I would like to do. And that is, let's try. Let's try. And that can be done in many ways. It can be done in many ways. But I think it's important to feed ourselves with the idea we can do something. We can really do something. And we have done, if you look over the last 15 years, the millions of small ecological revolutions taking place all over the world. Many people start doing small things. So I think in 15 years, 15 years, the situation will absolutely not the same as it is now. But it's only so if we will do something. So I think that's important to try, at least for me. But I can very well understand you. No, I, I'm, I'm all for trying. I'm just yeah, no, I, I do. But, 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 but you formulate it very well. Is yeah. A certain skepticism and pessimism. No, I'm that just saying that. No, dominant that part of our culture. I think it's not worth looking for that kind yeah. of morals anymore because we have run out of time to like be super pacific yeah, yeah, yeah. about any like moral judgment in that yeah. okay. tiny tiny area. But in the overall um, overview, oh, we well, can't yeah. say like well, but, but because it, it has to be like radical. It has to be like now and like big steps now that we can like, okay. maybe achieve something. Okay. And I think I'm all for trying because I mean if we don't if it doesn't work I'm sure someone will survive. Um, <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you.
that is tough for discussion. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a small uh, addition I want to make here is that uh, obviously I agree with your point where you say, like, well, the laws of physics and uh, evolution doesn't really care about our morals. And if you set morals up high, then you're taking the point of anthropocentrism. So you're saying that people first, then nature. And that's not how it works. That's the whole point, I believe, about this course setting. Thinking about nature first and our place in nature, and then adapting ourselves to that place. So that's. You don't have to subordinate. You don't have to subordinate any entity if you yourself don't see yourself as the like dominant controller. So if we change our ideology such that we don't see ourselves as the like doer, but we exist, then we don't have to subjugate morality or anything. We can just like coexist. Yeah. And this is about sustainability. It's on all levels, not only one. Right. Yeah. Not wild activism, because we don't know. It's on all sustainability. I think it's an interesting issue in the next courses we'll have here, because it's very fundamental. And also, you see, each of us have some opinions or ideas in this field. We don't articulate it very much, so it is a very great opportunity to create to have also these kind of discussions next to the practical information you will give here. I go to my next point and then um, we have not to go too far in uh, these reflections on a Monday morning. So. Um, I go to the local, <coughs> local perspective and I start with this image because I found it a very interesting aesthetic they feel it expresses some people think nature in the future will be like this. We are a great technical machine and we are creating within our machines some nature. But the other way around. I found that this is an artist. But it is interesting to to pose the question how are we interacting with nature? What can we exactly do technologically and how is there something given or pre-given in nature that we have to respect or to interact with is my work. So I found it interesting. And I zoom now from a, a global perspective to the local perspective. And as I said, one of the interesting things for me is that people will become aware of the earth and where we are now become in general active in the local place where they live. There is a strong relation between global awareness and local activity. I will do something mentality. I will contribute something to the question of unsustainable world and I will do something. So I found that interaction between the more you know about the global, the more you are motivated to do something fact, local. We have many examples, uh, you know them, I think, on local food, local energy, we are trying to obtain solar panels and that kind of things. Local um, construction, there is a whole, whole business now created about ecological housing, what that exactly means, isolation and so on. There is the greening around cities become more and more important because all our fitness activities will now be done, preferably in a green environment. So even for our simple reasons, green local places and sustainable becomes a way of expressing global responsibility in relation to sustainability. It goes even farther. And there is, a, there is a new idea coming up about local habitat. And that idea is make your local habitat as sustainable as possible. So that you are not dependent on 
international food change or international energy prices or international systems. So the sustainability of the local, some cities are doing that, are even, even competing on this field. How much can we become sustainable ourselves? The mayor of Paris recently said, a city like Paris can, in, in times of crisis, survive perhaps 14 days. What we have to do is to make our food system much more interactive with the local environment <coughs> so that we can interact on this fundamental issue of food with our local environment if there is an international crisis. There are now in fact rooftop gardens in Paris who are very, how to say, very, very sexy I would say, but also a very good idea. You, you, you go to your building and you eat the tomatoes from your own roof. So there is a kind of new creativity coming up, city gardening, that starts from this idea. Let's make our local city much more sustainable. I find that idea very well. And the cultural idea we have already talked about. The history I skip, but the biggest problems are the mega cities, and look at this item. It's still a project, but it is already mentioned, that uh, you was mentioning it, I think, that if the city can't go to the forest, can the forest go to the city? I didn't have that idea, but I found it a way of creativity, I think. We don't know. We don't know. Perhaps we can live in high towers and with millions of people in one place and we can make the place more sustainable than they are now. I found that an interesting idea. I, I just mentioned that if you look at the number of inhabitants of cities and in the Netherlands you don't find one city with more than one million inhabitants. We don't have it. Germany has four, India has 46, China has 120, all built, majority built in the last 50, 120 mega cities. You see the city will become a real important issue in the context of sustainability and we need new creativity, we need new creativity. I found this, I don't know, just yeah, crazy idea, I would say, but creativity is one of the main things we need. Is this, Urbanization 21st century, I have already said what I would like to say, the mega cities, the number, is humanity a species on earth that is going to live in mega cities, is that our, our destiny? I don't know, 70% is said. The greening of mega cities, urban agriculture, <coughs> vertical forest building, it has even a name, vertical forest building. And this is our basic question, we think the relation between the local, also the mega city, but also Groningen and also the village, the local and the global, and make it as sustainable as possible. I think you have the mayor of Ameland, who is it? Yes. Who would like that Ameland become a self-sustaining island. So you will have an example of a mayor who will try to do that. And it's not completely a fantasy. If you go to Milan, you can meet the architect who is at this moment trying to build two forest, vertical forest buildings in Milan and see what the effect is on yeah, the pollution, etc. Creativity. I think creativity is really a fantastic issue related to sustainability. And there universities can play a huge role because in this field, architecture, biology, forest knowledge, uh, 
knowing how to convince people that it's important as well, that you need space not only for humans to live, but for trees to live as well in the city. We don't have enough space for parks and so on, so perhaps we can go up. I don't know. I found it an interesting idea. Some questions here. Are some people of you involved in local activities or local experiments or local? Well, not myself, but um, we are uh, been to Detroit, where uh, a lot of community activities are being done uh, around city gardens because they have a lot of uh, a lot of space. Uh, and I think it's interesting because we usually focus on uh, university and highly educated people who can help and do things. And but these people are mostly um, isolated from other people and they wanted to do something as a community building exercise. Um, and they're generally very low educated, don't have a lot of means. And uh, here we see that they have their own garden so they can feed themselves more probably and uh, a community building and to do something about sustainability. So I found that was really interesting. Yeah, exactly. That's the kind of example I'm looking for. Yeah. Do you know other examples from your... Uh, re uh, restaurants, we uh, uh, use food and uh, yeah. uh, with ingredients uh, from uh, the uh, restaurant. Yeah, yeah, and also bio, bio. Yeah. Yeah, it's always bio. Never, the local is never not bio. Yeah. Local and bio are now very connected, eh? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I've got a moustache. I'm not sure about the <laughs> word, but... Uh, the same. <laughs> so, uh, even though I'm, uh, I'm living in an apartment, uh, three up, I still have my uh, little tomatoes and stuff like that. Okay. Which is great. It's great. Uh, yeah, it's only very few, but well. Yeah, yeah but you have to do is to start small. Indeed. Okay. Yeah, okay. Now, other examples you know from your city or village? On I think a very interesting project here in Groningen is the Free Food Cafe. Uh, the Free Food Cafe is all about wasting less food. So, I think twice a week they go into the city centre and go to approach different supermarkets and the market itself and get all the food they would throw away because they couldn't sell it anymore. Mm -hmm. And twice a week, or twice or three times a week, you can they come together and make a nice dinner out yes. of leftovers. Okay. Yeah. In France, it is even uh, obligatory that the big, big, big shops have to give what, what they didn't sell to a company, and the company makes food for people who can afford it. So it, it is becoming integrated in the system, the recycling of food, because we, we, we waste a lot of food. Yeah. Yeah. The interesting thing about the fruit, free food cafe here is that anyone can go. Anyone can so go. anyone can go and then you, you can sign up for or just come earlier and cook together, but you could also just come for eating and doing a bit of dishes afterwards and cleaning after yourself. Okay. Uh, a very counterproductive thing is happening currently in my hometown in Germany, in Bremen. 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 When uh, they now decided to ditch the usual uh, garbage company that always picks up the garbage and instead move it to one that is, I think, 150 kilometers out of the city to make out of the old garbage uh, energy, which is a good idea, but it's 150 kilometers away. Yeah. Yeah. Which means thousands of transporters <coughs> go every day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There and you see the, the calculator of the only goal that's helpful yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, that's true. But so it's already one step, you can say. It's a step, but it's, it's one step, but at the moment. bring it back to the city. That's your idea. Yeah. Okay. I saw another. Uh, yeah, well, I, I don't think it's very common here, but it kind of works like that. Because okay. food okay. sharing. Yeah. I think um, my friends from Berlin, they tell me all about it all the time. Um, it kind of works that way, but also the like, groups um, just go into the cities or supermarkets and get the rest of the stuff and um, then like, distribute it to like, certain um, stores that provide a 
refrigerator, for example, where you just put the food in, and just any person can go in there and uh, pick food up and then cook for themselves or whatever. Okay. So it's kind of sharing the food yeah, that food. other world gets yeah. thrown away. Or, mm -hmm. And I think there's even now a whole supermarket of that okay. food. Okay. And you can yeah. just, I don't know, go there and get like everything. Yeah. And if you walk through Berlin, there are all kinds of stores that put out their leftovers like bread and mm -hmm. in the evening and you can just pick it up and it's like tons of food and still good. Okay, nice. Yeah? Do we have energy for the last part? Or do we stop here? Just five minutes? Is that okay? And then we will stop. Because it is a, a tough topic. There is a lot of reflections in the morning and I will not overload you with my enthusiasm. So I have to be careful. But five minutes is okay? <coughs> Do you see any figure? There's a head of a man integrated in the picture. Is there a philosopher here who could recognize this philosopher? <laughs> no. Nietzsche. 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 Great. That's him. Mm -hmm. Here you see his moustache. And it are the animals who play an important part in this world. The lion and the cow, and the child, and the birds, and the fish. And so I found it nice people just to introduce the personal topic. And I take Nietzsche because my reflection on what we personally can do, I have worked it out in discussion with my preferred philosopher, who is called Friedrich Nietzsche. I wrote a book on it, Blijfde aan de Trouw. Blij door je voor Nietzscheanse theosofie. Het is only in Dutch, but it will perhaps be translated. You see the notion of theosofie. And why I did it with Nietzsche, why I asked Nietzsche or choose Nietzsche as my interactive partner, the idea is that Nietzsche, who lives in the 19th century, he lived from 1844 to 1900 was a philosopher who was very sensitive to modern culture and in particular the negative impacts of modern culture. He became sick of the modern lifestyle. He couldn't afford it any longer. And after having been professor in Basel for uh, 12 years, he was 25 years old when he started as professor and he left it at 36. He quit his job and he started living in the mountains in the summer, in the Alps. This was Maria, six months a year, and the rest of the time in the Mediterranean area, Nice, Venice, and so on. He has a very good sense for nice nature, I would say. So, to study him, I asked to follow him, so I went also to these places. And he has a very good nose. That, uh, to say. What he did was walking every day, five hours a day, five days a week, and then he just observed nature. He was very touched by animals, he was very touched by the vitality, the new emotions that it gave him, by a new way of life. He became very sensitive to what he did and how it was made. So, Already in the 19th century, he became very sensitive to issues that we, after all the crisis we have had, now become very sensitive. So then I found interesting and I asked myself how it's possible that before everyone saw it coming, he already had the feeling that modern, race, modern lifestyle could be destructive in relation to the earth. That I found interesting. And from there on, he started rethinking. And he started to criticize humans as the master of the universe, as the measure of all things. And he said, we have to reinvent <coughs> the new relation to the earth. That's it. Sie bleibt der eine Trau. This is a bit truthful to the earth, is the English translation. Became his new philosophy. And he would like to 
to find out what you say if you say Beatles or Tunia. Yeah. And from there on he started to criticize all our notions, our notions on happiness. What exactly is happiness? Of what exactly is health? What is great health? What is our emotional relation to nature when you are outside? Why do I feel myself so energized? So grateful. He came up in philosophy with the term grateful. If I walk outside and I see the sun and the sun is coming up every day, not asking everything for coming up, I feel myself very grateful to the earth. Strange emotion, grateful to the earth. Fear. He preferred walking in all the seasons and feel the wind and the rain and the cold and so on. What it, it does with your body when you accept the difference of climate on your personal body and from there on you start what did it with you, what did it with the animals, what did it with the trees and so on. So he is very close to experience, that's what I like, very close to walking alone outside and becoming aware of all what you see, animals included, therefore the animals. Uh, I would like to to finish with two things about Nietzsche. First is, from him is the expression, um, the earth had a skin, and the skin has an illness, and the illness is called man, in 1873. In my opinion, that's what, what touched me, I say that's exactly how many people now think. It is in a metaphorical way, you can immediately imagine skin, illness, man. It's a little bit negative, but the other part of Nietzsche is very positive. He's saying, our relation to the earth is a relation of vitality. You become more vital. And the best way to interact with the earth is to follow when humans become more vital. The whole notion of vitality became very important for him. What, what exactly is vitality? And his idea is, we don't know yet what vitality in the life system means and what vitality means in us. The two are linked. We have to find out. There are many ways, he said, to find out and we will discover a lot of things of the earth, but follow, if you will be really an, ec an ecological person, what does good to your body, what does good to your mind, and act conform in, in, in conformity with that idea. I will stop here, because I start preaching, and that's not a good idea. Um, if you are interested, you can find my explanations here. It starts with a personal description of Nietzsche's walking and what he did in Asia and what he saw by the, 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 the animals in particular. He liked the cows in particular. He said the cows have invented lying in the sun as a very important activity of life. And they lie in the sun. And it's so simple. So that's here, and in the second part it is what Nietzsche's philosophy can bring us in our time, and I try to develop ideas I have explained this morning, about uh, transforming a lifestyle, being more ecologically lo on the local place where you live, and having an overall framework for sustainability. That's it. I thank you very much for your attention, it was a great pleasure to be here, I hope that it was for you as well. And that's it. Thank you.